Ground plans gave us a bird's eye view of the set so we could place it on stage. Elevations help give the information the scene shop will need to actually physically construct the set, particularly all the vertical features. Purposes for an elevation, therefore, clarify the dimensions of the design, adding more dimensions that we gave in the ground plan, physically giving heights of walls, widths of doors, uh, dimensions of windows, etc. You'll see that we have taken each of the scenic wall units and laid them out one by one in a row. Walls that touch each other are pulled apart and laid out flat. If you think about the elevation as model pieces that could be cut out and assembled into a physical model, you've got a basic idea of what an elevation is like. Notice all the dimension information that is included in an elevation that we really didn't have in the ground plan. We actually have each wall unit represented with its full detail. We typically have a ground plan of that wall unit by itself. We have the dimensions for the actual construction and height and physical layout of that scenic unit. We frequently have a side view, so we rotated that flat front piece sideways so we can see how wide it is dimensionally. And then we have added notes to give more clarification of how the design works. Elevations also provide construction information. This is called an orthographic drawing. This is a scenic unit that is needed for one of the set designs and has to be constructed from scratch. Notice that we see this piece in full front, side, and back view, each one giving full dimensions so that the scene shop can physically recreate that piece. Note that below the front, side, and back views are ground plans of those pieces as well. Elevations offer detail information that's needed by the scene shop to complete the scenic design. For this example, we have a wall unit that has several moldings on it. Notice how we have what are called uh, revolved sections or cross cuts of each of those cornices so the scene shop can see the physical dimension of each one of them. How do we create elevations? First of all, we'll set the title block, just like we did in the ground plan. We'll add another sheet, add a number to the drawings we've already created, and call it the elevation for our production. We might have multiple elevations depending on how much room it's going to take to draw them. Then we're going to lay out the basic outlines for each of the scenic pieces. As the one we saw at the very beginning in the elevation, these are the basic shapes of all the wall units. We see front views of them side views, and top views. Next, we'll insert the internal elements, all the full detail to give information. Next, we'll add enlarged details as needed. Sometimes an element doesn't stand by itself. It needs more explanation or a larger view to make it easier to understand for the scene shop. Again, looking at this flat unit, we needed a cross section or a revolved section, as it's called, for the coordinates at the top, the picture board molding, the chair rail, and the bottom rail. This is the typical way of representing those, laying in a solid color cross section of the molding on top of the actual piece with kind of a halo edge around it so it doesn't blend in. Here's an example of a bookshelf unit that needs to be built into the set. It is actually an L-shaped bookcase, so we're looking at the left side of it with the cutaway of where the right hand inserts, 
And then on the right, we're looking at the right-hand information of the unit, where the piece on the left-hand side fits in. Here is an example of a detail drawing, or a sectional, for a fireplace piece. Notice how we render the full front. Then we would use the bracket information that you see with the two arrows pointing that shows that we're cutting the unit in the center and then showing the left-hand side of it. So to the right, we now see that section. Notice that the top portion is hatched to let us know that we're looking at a cut view and we're looking at the left side of the unit. Below, we also have a floor plan of that unit, and the dotted lines suggest that as we look through the top mantle, we can see the moldings below it in the dotted lines or hidden line mode. Next, we will then label and dimension everything for clarity. Looking at this elevation again, you'll see full labels and dimensions and all the information needed to fully understand this drawing. Let's get into some of the conventions of dimensioning, some of the rules of thumb that we should follow. First of all, all of our dimensions should be perpendicular to the object profile. We want to make sure that we are showing the dimension in its full scale, so the scene shop could actually lay a ruler next to it and follow our markings. We're going to use extension lines, lines that come out from the top and bottom or any uh, finished edge of a scenic piece, and then a line in between that demarks the actual dimension, and we'll add the dimension in the middle of that line. We're going to center that measurement within those extension lines. We're going to try never to cross over dimensions because that can be confusing. We're going to add end arrows, slashes, or dots at the end of the dimension lines, and we need to be consistent in selecting either an arrow or a slash or a dot. We're going to provide only the measurements that are needed for full construction. When we're dimensioning a circle, we'll give its diameter, and when we're dimensioning an arc, we'll use its radius. So, here is a close-up of our elevation so we can see more detail. Notice that we have all the drawing completed. We're ready now to dimension and label. Here is a label that would be important to allow the scene shop to know that these are opposite sides of the same flat. So in other words, this is a fairly wide flat. You'll notice from the center box rectangle that represents the end or the side view of that same flat. We will then add extension lines at the top and the bottom. Note that the extension lines uh, do not touch the physical drawing of the scenic piece. They're about a sixteenth of an inch away. Then we'll draw a line down and we'll add slashes on this one to show the endpoints of that line. That tells us that this wall is 10 foot 10 inches tall. We also can note other dimensions within the wall unit. Again, we're using extension lines that do not touch the wall unit. We have a 9-foot door unit and, consequently, a 9-foot bookshelf that happens to match the door and window above. Then we'll throw in a 2-foot 10 measurement to show the height of the bottom cabinet of the bookshelf. Now we'll add all the other measurements. Note towards the center that we've now shown the full height of the diagonal wall, that is 12 foot, 10 inches tall. We've offered the height of the chair rail, that is 3 foot, 6 inches. And on the right hand side, we're showing some of the actual spacing for how big the window is above the door and how big the door itself is. Note that we're not drawing any of these dimensions on top of the scenic unit. Always use extension lines that don't touch the unit, but just give us the dimensions so we can actually build the unit. Occasionally we'll use full dimensions, the 12 foot wide wall, and then we'll use intermediate measurements. So the one side wall is only 2 foot 9 over to the end of the bookcase. Then we have the door frame. Then we have a 6 foot door and then the door frame, and then a 2 foot 9 extension on the other side of the door, so the door is fairly well centered within that wall unit. 
please note that the door frame or molding is narrow enough that it's hard to actually write its measurement between the extension lines. So we can physically write those measurements and then refer to with a leader line where that measurement applies. A leader line comes from the front or the back of a label, like three inches, and then diagonally towards the area it refers to and ends or is punctuated with an arrow. Over here we'll denote the exact same measurements on the outside. Also note that in these dimensions we've chosen to place the numbers on top of the actual measurement lines. Either one is correct. We should just be consistent within the drawing. Here we have a finished elevation. Let's look at some of the parts of it. If we start at the top left, we'll notice that it's basically showing each unit from its side to its face, to the next side, to the next face, to the next side, etc., etc., until we get a full revolve of all the pieces. I want to point out that sometimes we could actually, like the top left-hand unit, give all the dimensions and simply tell the shop to make two of these, because the wall piece just to its right has those same reveals on both sides. It's not necessary to draw them both. We could simply state there are two of these, one on each side of the wall. Note also in the next piece, that is the downstage right wall piece, we have circled certain areas of the rendering and given them an alphabet number. That suggests that if we would go to another area of the design, there is going to be more information that will provide the actual sectioning for these units. So, if we look over towards the right, enlarged, detail A, which refers back to the A circle in the top left-hand corner. This shows a sectional of that actual cornice piece and its full dimensions in detail. Notice that just below it is detail B, the little diagonal crown molding that refers back to the B area on the downstage right flat. Then we drop down to C, which is the top of the chair rail, and that detail is also shown over on the down far right corner, detail C. Then we'll look just below detail A to a long, tall unit that is actually labeled to its left, detail D, the baseboard. That refers back to downstage right wall D circle. As we work our way across, we'll note that we have a fireplace represented. This is called halving. Because this is a fully symmetrical wall, we can provide all the information on one side of it and then use dotted lines to simply suggest that the other side is identical. You'll note also as we get to the kitchen backing that much of the detail is actually done in dotted lines. This refers to items that are going to be placed on that wall, but we're not providing the full information here. There are pots and pans and pictures and plates that are hanging on the wall that don't need full description here. As we drop down, we notice that we are looking at an archway, and in this drawing, we are referring to the actual radius of the arch with a diagonal dimension at nine foot. Notice that if we go over two more drawings, we're looking at the window seat, the alcove bay window arch. There's an archway and below that is a seat. We see the front dimension of it below and we also see the seat top tipped up facing us and we can see full dimension for it as well. Please note that under each unit is a full description, defining, describing, and giving any other information that needs to be represented. Also, please note a fairly typical thing in an elevation. If we look at the top door unit for the kitchen door and drop down to the bottom of its notes, you'll notice a triangle that says sconce next to it. Go back to the wall and you'll notice a triangle with a little X inside of it. It is a fairly common standard for a practical light to be represented with a triangle. Over far left, you'll see another one represented on the downstage right side. There's a sconce on that wall as well. This hopefully has been a good introduction to you for elevations. 
Obviously, we can't cover all the different variations that you'll run into. I would recommend that you look at the USITT manual because it might give you further hints on some of the symbols and some of the labeling techniques that can be used so that they're understood effectively in your elevations.